All right. So I hope you're all here for nature journaling today. I assume you are. And I just want to thank you. Um, this is the first time we've offered this class. And um, in particular, we, we love working with um, Palmetto Library and sharing um, kind of this space with them and, and reaching our different audiences. And so we're, we're really excited about this series, in particular, because we kind of culminate the class um, in National Poetry Month and we get to have some fun kind of looking at poetry and nature and nature journaling and how those things are related. Um, but I'm just gonna introduce myself and then I'm gonna let Eileen introduce herself and then, and then we'll get started. Um, so my name is Alyssa Vinson and I'm the residential horticulture agent here at the Manatee County Extension Office. And I would like to see just like raise of hands. You can put up your little hand reaction guy if you want. Um, how many of you are familiar with extension? You know who we are and what we are. Okay, a couple hands. I, I'm guessing that um, the two people that are uh, Master Gardener volunteers in the <laughs> audience know. <laughs> um, but uh, so extension, is a uh, function of the land grant university system. And so we are a cooperative nonprofit um, that is uh, Manatee County government and the University of Florida. And so what, what I do, I'm considered faculty of the university and I function in a way to kind of take all of that good research and information that's, that's discovered at the university level and then I distill it and make it relevant and applicable for people in my particular community. And so that's really my goal is to um, bring relevancy and, um, and interest to topics that are research based uh, at the University of Florida. So that's who I am. That's what we do. Um, and today we're going to talk about nature journaling, which is going to be awesome. So Eileen, you can go ahead and introduce yourself. Hello everyone, I am Eileen Valdez and I am the Assistant Supervisor at the Palmetto Library with the Manatee County Public Library System and we're excited to have Alyssa back again for some more programs. Um, you know, last year she did whew, probably like a dozen programs for us, so this will be uh, another fun one. Um, so the libraries, we are still kind of chugging along. Um, we actually realized today is our one year anniversary of the last day uh, before we close to the public. So um, that's something. Um, we're still kind of doing the online programs, but it looks like we're getting a little bit closer to doing um, first outdoor programming in person. And then probably um, maybe looking at the summertime, we might be doing some in-person programming. Um, so slow and steady, but uh, your Manatee libraries are open and um, we are happy to have you and come on in. And uh, now we will shoot it back to Alyssa and we'll get started with nature journaling day one. All right. And so one of the things that I really love um, about this topic is that it is so um, applicable to uh, all kinds of different interests, right? You can have somebody who's very interested in plants or birds or bugs, and any of those interests can kind of wrap up in nature journaling. And I, I love um, Rachel Carson um, is one of my favorite authors just in general. She wrote a lot of books other than just Silent Spring. And she has this great quote that's here um, right underneath this red winged blackbird. Those who contemplate the beauty of the earth find reserves of strength that will endure as long as life lasts. And we're gonna talk today um, about um, just kind of what nature journaling is. Today's kind of the, our, our introduction, right? And this is a six part series. So what, what is nature journaling? Kind of some of the history, um, what are the research-based documented health benefits to individuals who, who practice nature journaling? Um, some of the supplies you might want and then you know, ideas for how to get started. So that's what we're gonna do. And I want to kind of get to know you a little bit and I want you to kind of get to know each other because if you're gonna join us for the rest of the um, six classes, I wanna make sure we, we kind of all know who we are. And so there's uh, something called a jam board 
that you can use that allows you to have a lot of people kind of writing things down at the same time. And so um, I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to put the link to the Jamboard in the chat box. And, and then I'm going to break you all up into uh, breakout rooms. Okay. Have, how many of you have ever done breakout rooms before? Okay. So it's really easy. And, and what I'll do is I just, I just put you in a room. It'll say <clears throat> you've been assigned and, and you have a blue button that says join and you hit join. And what, what that's going to be is it just gets you in a smaller kind of separate room where there's only three people and you're just going to introduce yourselves to each other and talk a little bit about why you're interested in nature journaling. I'm going to go ahead and stop my share just for a second so that I can get this <clears throat> link in the chat for you all. All right. And I'm going to show you what the Jamboard looks like before we go into the breakout rooms. And I'm going to try to familiarize you with these tools that we're going to use over the next few weeks um, so that we all are kind of on the same page. So <clears throat> I'm share my screen again so you can see what it looks like. So this is what a Jamboard looks like. It's basically just kind of a shared bulletin board space. When you follow the link, you'll, you'll, you'll see a bunch of um, little animal icons that pop up up here, that's people joining. And then it's really simple what you can do. When you look at the Jamboard on the left-hand side, there are different icons that allow you to do different things. So you have a pen, you can write with a pen, you can erase that pen, this is an eraser. This is just a, a pointer, right? Your, your standard cursor. And then this is your sticky note. And this allows you to type a sticky note and put that sticky note on the Jamboard. So I'm just gonna write, test and you see that you have a sticky note that you can then kind of place on the Jamboard. I'm just gonna delete that one. Um, you can also do things, I like the laser a lot, the laser's fun, woo! <laughs> um, so there are a few different tools that you can use, but we're gonna be focusing on this first Jamboard. You're gonna write on a sticky note why you're interested in nature journaling, and then you're just gonna leave it there. Okay. Does anyone have any questions about that before I put you into your breakout rooms? No? Okay. All right. I'm going to stop my share again. So you should find the Jamboard link in the chat. Have, has everybody found that? Give me a thumbs up. Okay. All right. <laughs> okay, so I'm going to go ahead and, and put you into breakout rooms now. And when I open the rooms, you'll go ahead and just click on the join button. All right. Draper and Holly, if you're having um, trouble, you may be on, if you're on a mobile device, that it may be more difficult for you to access the breakout room. But again, you, there should be a blue button that says join.
All right. While we're coming back, I'm going to go ahead and share the screen. I love these. These are great. Everybody will be back in just a second. All right. Awesome. Well, thank you all for sharing, um, you know, why you wanted to join us today and um, think about and learn more about nature journaling. I, I love a lot of your answers. You know, folks are looking for um, ways to better identify plants and flowers, remembering some of the things that they're looking at, um, trees and birds, especially, um, you know, wanting to know more about the world around them. Maybe you've been interested in journaling in the past, but you're not so great at it. Um, and maybe you want to try again. Um, I'm, I'm definitely one of those people. I'm not an expert nature journaler. I love the concept of journaling and I, I definitely approach it in fits and starts, right? I, I'll get really excited and I'll buy a new notebook and I'll do it for a couple months. And then it kind of starts to fade out a little bit. And then I get really excited about it again. And so um, so learning how to sustain that as a habit, I think, is, is something that, that I personally want to work on through the course of kind of teaching this class and engaging with this topic. So this is great. And <clears throat> so we're going to go ahead and I'm going to um, jump back into the uh, presentation here. And let's see. <clears throat> there we go. Is everybody seeing that in presentation mode just so that it's not, you don't have all the extra stuff around the edges? Okay, good. So, at its simplest, right, when we talk about nature journaling, it really is just a tool for observations of the natural world, right? It's a way for us to capture our observations. Our brains are really, really good at seeing lots of things and then dismissing a lot of things, right? Because we focus on what is the most immediate need um, and, and what things could potentially be um, harmful to us, right? Like our, our brains are hardwired to focus on potential danger. <laughs> and so, so we, we receive all of this stimuli over the course of our day. And, and it's, it's really just normal for our brains to dismiss a lot of it. And so one of the great things I think um, that comes with nature journaling is this tool that you now have to capture these observations before they're gone, right? You, you can take time to really be in the moment and, and, and write down these observations so that you don't lose them. Um, it's also a good method for data collection. And we'll talk a little bit about that, but some of the best information we have about plant and animal species, particularly from hundreds of years ago, is based on nature journals that people who were traveling around that you know the, the early naturalists would would collect all of this observational information and we rely on a lot of that data now as as scientists to kind of compare natural communities that we have existing or species that we have existing to those that existed in the past it also functions as a creative outlet um, I love to write. 
Um, and like, I'm not very good at it, but I love to write. And so um, nature journaling is, is a way to express the creative side of yourself. And especially for folks who maybe do something, um, you know, I'm, I'm lucky enough that my job is pretty creative. Um, but for some folks who are really into the quantitative uh, or their job is very uh, methodical and uh, repetitive, right? Being able to kind of break out of that mold and do something creative is really important for our brains. It's really good to exercise that side. And so when we think about the history of nature journaling, right? Humans have been documenting nature since our earliest evolution, right? So I have this cave painting up here because this is, you know, this is essentially nature journaling, right? They didn't have paper back then, but they were making obser observations of the natural world and documenting them in, in the way that they could. And this documentation allowed them to, to make sense of what they were seeing. Um, you know, this is reflected in things like ancient mythology, um, different kinds of writings from, from poets from thousands of years ago. And we'll talk more about that when we get to the last class when we talk about poetry. Um, but one of, the, one of the things that is kind of unique about nature journaling is that it's very uh, place-based and personal. So we don't learn just about the object or natural environment that is under observation. We learn about the person who is writing down those observations because it's impossible to, to keep yourself and your values um, out of what you're writing when you're writing these things down. Uh, you know, it, as I said earlier, it was really important for us to have these, these nature journals. You think about like travels with Bartram, uh, William Bartram, when he, when he walked you know, the whole East Coast down into Florida, the uh, documentation that, that he has provided to us as, as naturalists, as botanists, is just incredible. Um, the, the species that he, that he listed, that he recognized, right? We rely on these observations to make determinations about whether or not a plant species is native or not, right? We, we, look, at, we look at those um, journals and those documents to say, were these kinds of plants here? How long have they been here? What were they used for? Um, and then some of, you know, the biggest natural sciences discoveries have come from people making keen observations and, and journaling. People like Rachel Carson and Charles Darwin, right? <clears throat> they were observing the natural world, writing things down, and they noticed, <clears throat> in Rachel Carson's case, changes, right, that, that weren't attributable to <clears throat> kind of natural cycles. And so, so she kind of made this connection that was really important for the world um, in, in recognizing the, the challenges with pesticide use and, and impacts on, on um, bird species. So, so <clears throat> these kind of firsthand reports um, of observations of the natural world have led to a lot of really important scientific discoveries. And something else that I really want to emphasize is that it's fairly recent in human history, you know, maybe going back to industrial revolution, maybe a little bit before then, but it's only really recently in human history that we find ourselves kind of outside of nature, right? We, we now think of nature as something outside of ourselves rather than something that that we are a part of, right? We've done a really good job of compartmentalizing ourselves away from what we consider to be nature. Um, and so nature journaling kind of gives us that window back into a world in which we belong. Um, and, and so I think that that's a really um, awesome <laughs> kind of side effect of nature journaling. Okay, so <clears throat> we talked about how nature journaling is personal observation, right? And it's impossible to remove 
the human element from those personal observations. So we have on the second Jamboard, we follow the same link and we, we don't have to go into a breakout room for this. But if you would please um, go to that second Jamboard and you'll see up at the top, there's a little arrow you can go back and forth. It's one of three. So you can click a, the arrow on the right hand side to go to the Jamboard two. I would like you to read the excerpt and it's here, but it's also on the Jamboard. And examine the language that was used and write down how the author makes you feel. Are there any values that you see in that language? Are there any, um, can, can you kind of guess at who this person was and what they enjoyed based on how they wrote about this topic? So we're gonna take um, about three minutes or so to do this. And I'm gonna stop my share so that I can go look at the Jamboard while you guys are writing down, all right? I put the Jamboard link again in the uh, in the chat box if you were missing it. Sometimes the text gets outside of the uh, the sticky note there. I saw Eileen, I think, was trying to resize it to make it fit. <laughs> So good observation. Um, it feels like a Robert Frost poem. I like that. Because there's something that you feel specifically when you read Robert Frost, right? And so, so something about this is triggering that same response in you. I like that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Good. Yeah, so I'm seeing um, 
you know, this is visceral. You can really feel it. Um, you notice that they're kind of being playful with the language and you can, you can kind of get all of the different senses. Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. Exploration and discovery, exciting. Um, yeah, this person is, is, is excited and not deterred by the bad weather, right? Incredibly alive in the moment. Yes, yes. Absolutely, I really wanted to pull that out of this. Um, and so this is Thoreau. Um, uh, if you are a fan of, of his writing, you may have noticed uh, or recognized it, but yeah, this is Thoreau. And when I think of someone who kind of, at least in, in American literature, right, who has been incredibly influential on how we perceive nature writing, right, Thoreau is one of those where it's like, oh, you know, you got to go to Thoreau. Um, but the thing that I really wanted to pull out from it was this sense of being completely in the moment, this keen observation with all the senses, and the obvious joy with which they are out and about in the wider world, right? Um, and I, you know, I have, I have a, a five-year-old daughter and a two-year-old son. And um, Rachel Carson has this great quote where she talks about um, the wonder um, of, of childhood and, and wanting to preserve that wonder. Um, and in that you need an adult who can experience it and share it with a child. And I think that as we, as we grow up um, and we have a lot of experiences and we, and we get a lot of um, baggage, for lack of a better word, um, it's easy for us to forget how amazing everything is, how wonderful it is, and that we can experience joy in very small, simple moments. Um, and so that's something that I, I think that is really um, applicable to the, to the act of nature journaling. Um, you know, if you're, if you're familiar with um, mindfulness activities, right? It really is asking you to be present in this moment and nature journaling asks you to be present in this moment using your different senses to observe the world. So thank you for sharing. I'm gonna go ahead and come back here. And one of the things that I wanted to highlight as we kind of start um, on this process of, of you know, getting, getting our nature journals up and running and going out and practicing um, different strategies is recognizing the health benefits of nature journaling. And I spent a lot of time in preparation for this course reading um, medical journal articles and um, psychological journal articles and, and kind of finding the most common um, physiological, and mental health benefits um, of journaling and nature journaling and um, even like just small amounts of time spent in nature. And so one of the, one of the biggest um, kind of observations on human health that can be made across the board, either um, taking time to just journal, taking time to be just outside or taking time to be outside and journaling any of those three activities are going to lead to decreased stress. Um, and this has been documented in dozens of um, research papers I was able to find that we experience a decrease in stress. And I think that, um, you know, if you're familiar with what stress does to our body, then you'll know that a decrease in stress also means an increase in heart health. Um, you know, you're gonna have, um, uh, an increase in your in your just general positivity, your mental health, right? So so decreasing your stress is is one of the best things you can do for your health. So any way we can find to decrease our stress um, is really important for us. And nature journaling is one of those things that can do that. Um, it has been shown to sharpen 
and maintain observational skills, even in individuals who have some kind of um, um, neurodegenerative issues. Um, and so uh, you can, by focusing and um, practicing writing, uh, observations, you can sharpen and maintain those observational skills even in the face of, of health cha challenges. <clears throat> it encourages mindfulness, which is associated again with decreased stress, um, general positivity, happiness. Um, and when you have these practices that focus on mindfulness in one aspect of your life, they tend to seep over into, into other areas of your life as well. When we spend time in nature, we actually are um, being exposed to some essential compounds that are found in nature. So these are your different chemicals that trees and plants give off that we wouldn't get um, we wouldn't be able to uh, ingest if we weren't kind of breathing them in. Um, so this is something that being just out in nature can allow you to do. So you get these kind of essential compounds. Um, and this is kind of a, not necessarily a health benefit, but a benefit that I see, which is, you know, if you are a really creative person, um, practicing these keen observations and maybe taking some, some quantitative measurements can encourage more technical expertise, or maybe you really like plants, but you, you can't tell a grass from a sedge or, you know, whatever, then you could, you know, kind of gain that knowledge the more often you observe these plants and the more often you learn the appropriate vocabulary for how to describe them. So our next class, we're gonna talk specifically about kind of what is the language for describing how a plant looks? How, how do you, how do you um, look at a plant and write things down about that plant that will allow you to then identify what it is, right? And so you can gain that technical expertise. And, this last one, this cure for green blindness, this is something that I run across um, when I lead kind of uh, walks for people either in the garden or, or um, out in a natural area, is that a lot of folks just see green, right? They just, they, they, they just see a wall of green and they don't recognize that wall of green as 15, 20 different species of plants. And so again, when you have this, um, this practice of keen observation, it allows you to more quickly isolate the different kinds of plants or, or even animals that you're seeing. I know that it, it's a learned skill to be able to be passing by, um, you know, a line of woods uh, in your car and say, oh, uh, poplar, beech, pine, you know, a lot of people would just say, oh, trees, okay? And so, so that, um, that practice of, of writing and observing is going to help kind of help you hone in again on some of those characteristics that will let you figure out what you're looking at. There are different methods for observation, right? We can take quantitative data, meaning I could go out with a tape measure or a, um, bathymetry rod or um, a compass, and I could take down quantitative information. I could measure a plant. I could tell you um, which direction this uh, certain section of trees is oriented to. I could uh, measure the diameter at breast height of a tree, right? These are quantitative observations that we can write down that can help us, again, if we're looking to identify species or if we're just wanting to kind of practice that quantitative side um, of our brain. We could have qualitative observations, um, brown as a river eel, right? <laughs> that, that, gives you, that gives you a description of the color of something, but, but also, in a way that evokes some kind of emotion, right? So that, that's that qualitative, how, how are you describing these things? And you can, you can also do things like leaf or bark rubbings, which is not just for kids at summer camp, it's really fun. <laughs> and, and you can get some really, um, really beautiful and intricate 
art um, by doing leaf rubbings. I mean, you can really get a lot of really exciting detail. Um, seed collection, flower pressings, um, doing graphical representations. If you go to the same spot over the course of a month and you watch the progression of a certain plant, right? You could, you could put a graph in your nature journal and say, it was this tall this day, it was that tall the next day. Um, you can do drawings and sketches that are creative or you can do drawings and sketches to scale where you actually provide you know, a scale bar and you know that that drawing or sketch is as accurate as you can make it um, as far as a representation of, of what you're looking at. Um, so these are just some of the, the methods that we can use when we are out observing. And, and I'll talk a little bit about kind of what tools you might want. Um, but again, not only um, seed, seed collection, flower pressings, leaf and bark rubbings, drawings and sketches, watercolors, you can also uh, write poetry, include inspirational quotes, include anecdotes, right? This all kind of wraps up with that um, personal human element of, of what we're looking at. And I wanted to include this here because I'm a horticulture agent. And so I talk a lot about gardening, but nature doesn't have to be just something kind of out in what we consider a wild space, right? Uh, a lot of us have gardens. I know, um, was it Beverly who was saying that she does a lot of gardening and is really interested in gardens and buys a lot of plants and stuff like that. And nature journaling has some really fabulous applications for gardeners, for people who have active gardens, who maintain gardens. We can take down seasonal observations about our garden. We can write down variety and cultivar information. How well did this variety do? Was this cultivar better? Um, what kind of soil did I put that in again? What was the mix of, of compost to sand to perlite? I don't really remember, but if I write it down, then I have, have a record of it. I can look at things like companion planting and say, hey, you know, I planted these carrots next to my tomatoes and they didn't seem to do very well. But when I planted my carrots next to, you know, this uh, fennel plant, it did fine. And so looking at things like companion planting, are there certain things that I have planted together that don't do so well, maybe I need to mix it up a little bit. Think about things like soil building reminders, right? If you have a vegetable garden and you're using fertilizers and things like that, um, you know, your soil can, can get a little tired after a while and you might need to go out and, and do some soil building, but you can write down, you know, what I did when and how does the soil look? How does it smell? How does it feel, right? A lot of those things can inform um, the decisions we make about our gardens. Um, when you do get to the space where you're, you're, you know, if you're growing food that you eat, how did it taste? Was, how different is it to eat a carrot that you pull out of your own garden versus a carrot you get at the grocery store? What, what was it crisper? Was it sweeter? What did you notice? How did it smell? Um, if you're if you're into gardening just for the beauty of it, then you know what colors really popped for you. What um, what texture on that leaf really just made you you know sing, right? There are certain plants that I just can't help but touch <laughs> because they um, have such an interesting, unique uh, texture to them. So, so writing down all of these observations about our garden can be a really great way for us to have better, healthier gardens. But also, um, again, we get a lot of the same benefits as we would from going out into a wild space. Another um, aspect of this for people who um, are managing their landscape, right? If you're going out into your yard and you're using nature journaling as a tool of observation, you can write down what insects you see, when you see them, um, whether or not any other bugs were eating those bugs, what kind of damage they left on your plant. And then if you tried to get rid of them, how effective was it? So it becomes an integrated pest management tool as well for people who are, are taking down these observations. I have to share, I had a ladybug last night just 
walking around in circles on my, I was reading a book of poetry and it just kept walking around and around and around my poetry book last night. Um, and so this picture reminded me of that, but it was, it was interesting. It hung out for quite, quite some time. Okay, so I wanna give you all a chance to, to share. What, what, are you, what are you thinking so far? Is, um, are you still excited to, to get started nature journaling? Um, please go ahead and unmute yourself and, and let's have a little bit of a conversation before we get into um, the kind of last few slides um, where we talk about getting started. I think maybe, oop, I don't know if anyone else has unmuted themselves, but uh, I'll go first. Um, some of you may know that we are in the beginning stages of developing a garden um, here at the Palmetto Library. So this makes me very, very excited and gives me many, many ideas um, for a way that we can get the community more involved in kind of doing a, a community um, journal for our little garden. Um, so hopefully some of the things that we learn here, we can um, either repeat once our garden is is up and growing or, um, you know, teach others. So I've got a lot of ideas already. So thank you, Alyssa. I've been gardening for a long time. Um, I find that I'll start out on one little pad of paper and write for a while and then go on to another one. And I've, I've, um, I saw this topic and I thought it was interesting. It, it would be a way for me to pull it all together and, and create an overall journal. Now, I don't know that that'll happen where I would go back 25 years, but, <laughs> or I would even be able to find those notes, but that's what interested interested me um also talking about vegetable gardening how and the things that you do to your soil and um how you see a difference um so that's that's another thing that we document a little bit but not as much as we can or should and then when when we go back it was like hey why does this carrot look different than the ones that we planted before and if we had written down that information um we would know mm -hmm. Patsy grows like the most amazing vegetables, y'all. Just just so that you know. <laughs> I picked up. We picked um, carrots last night. Uh, we dug some blue potatoes. Um, we were having corned beef, and so I cheated and I bought an onion. But the rest of the vegetables, it was beautiful. Um, the blue potatoes and the I had purple carrots and orange carrots and white carrots, and um, it it's just pretty. Mm -hmm. And it makes it even more fun. And speaking of um, growing your own food, um, I pick broccoli and I'll, I'll eat it. And the flavor, it's amazing. Um, what the stuff that you pick versus what you buy at the store, mm -hmm. the, the one vegetable that makes the absolute most difference to me are tomatoes, but um, mm -hmm. I just love tomatoes. But the, even broccoli, I mean, everything, it just, it is so fun to, um, to pull a carrot out of the ground and, and, or pull a beet out of the ground or whatever. Um, a friend of mine, she asked me if I wanted a daikon radish the other day. And I said, how big is it? And she said, it's about the size of my arm. And sure enough, so I made some kimchi. I'm waiting for that to ferment. Thanks. Go ahead. Yeah, that's great. Um, yeah, I have a, I'll, maybe I'll share a story about asparagus here in, in a, in a couple of weeks. Anybody else want to share? I'm so excited. Thank you for this program. It seems so wonderful already. Um, I, I was really, um, what, I wrote, what do I have on my notes? What really uh, was quite interesting and fascinating for me was um, you talking about quantitative versus qualitative, because I'm so interested in um, exploring kind of quantitatively observing the outdoors and incorporating that with the creative way that I uh, will use poetry or use language to kind of explain. Um, so I just am so excited about that. And I, I, and also too, you talking about, um, just thinking about leaf as a mechanism for pigment. I just think that's quite fascinating. Never thought of that. Mm -hmm. Um, cause in the past I've, uh, like kind of used the, uh, remnants of like palm fronds that have dried up. Mm -hmm. So I never thought about leaves. So in that way, cause I like to play around with foliage anyways, but I never mm -hmm. thought about it, um, in that way. So I'm, really inspired and really, really excited, especially to work that quantitative um, muscle more, which is really exciting for me. So awesome. thank you. Yeah, thank you. 
Yeah. All right. Well, we just have a couple more slides left. Um, and, you know, I just want to kind of highlight this isn't a be all or end all list, right? You can you can go online and find a million billion resources for like what is the best notebook, right? <laughs> and it depends on on what you're trying to do. Um, but the only thing I would I would recommend is that when you do get a notebook, find something that has like a heavyweight paper. You don't want just kind of a, a standard um, uh, like school notebook. You want something that has a nice heavyweight paper. Um, lined or unlined doesn't really matter. Depends on what your preference is. If you tend to write more or draw more, um, you could use a sketchbook if you wanted to. Um, you're gonna want, you know, pens and pencils, crayons. I like I like crayons a lot. Um, I also have two small children, so I have lots of crayons. <laughs> Um, chalk or charcoal are really good too for, for doing bark rubbings. Um, and then you're going to want some other tools that you can use to help you observe, right? Binoculars. You're not going to get the detail of a bird unless you have binoculars, right? They're going to, they're going to flutter away from you. Um, measuring tape, rulers, things like that. Field guides are going to be a great resource. So um, nowadays we all have you know, we've all got these, right? And um, you can get some really good field guides kind of downloaded on your phone. You can use things like iNaturalist, um, which allow you to take photos or record sounds and upload them. And then the collective hive mind all gets together and tries to tell you what, you know, plant or bug or mushroom that was. Um, if you're going out into kind of a, um, a space that is is not so um, centrally located, you know, make sure that you have a map or um, a compass or a GPS and water and all those kinds of things. Think about, you know, uh, think about what you would need to be safely out hiking for for some time or or um, you know away from from amenities, right? So those are some things to consider. But again, um, you know, there's lots of different brands of notebooks. I have used uh, Baron Fig in the past, and that one's pretty good. It's got a nice heavyweight paper. It has um, good, um, you also want probably a pretty stiff front and back cover. So not something really flimsy front and back cover. You want something um, pretty stiff. So, so look for those. Don't spend a million bucks on it though. You can get crazy with these notebooks. <laughs> I, I spent some time um, in preparation for this class, looking at at different um, available notebooks, and and you can really spend a lot of money on a notebook. Um, so I would say, just starting out, just get something again with that heavyweight paper, stiff front and back cover, lined or unlined doesn't really matter. And I will pop in quickly here to say that your manatee libraries do check out binoculars. So if you're wow. unsure of which ones to get, you can always come and check them out from us. So another little caveat there. <laughs> Yeah, perfect. Perfect. That's great. Yeah. Um, and so the last thing that I want us to do um, before we wrap up today, it's, you know, we talked a little bit about how it's fairly recent that humans have found themselves kind of outside of nature. And um, I really think it's important for us to have experiences that remind us keenly that we are not separate from nature. Um, because when we recognize ourselves as a part of something, we're more likely to feel protective, right? Of that space and of that, of that, of that thing that we've identified. And so, you know, for me personally, one, one of my goals um, is to, you know, is to, to teach my children how to love the world that we live in and to want to take care of it. And, and so, um, but we can only do that when we feel a, a sense of place and a sense of ownership and a sense of responsibility. And so I, I'd like to hear from, from you all, you know, this definition of nature, right? It's really tricky. It's really variable. It's dependent upon your culture and your values and kind of what experiences you've had in your life with kind of broader nature. And so I want to I want to know from you um, where do we find nature? And you'll see on the Jamboard, and I'll swap my screen real quick so that you can see this last one. <clears throat> it's 
So the third um, kind of board for us today is where do we find nature and what is nature? So go ahead and just put your thoughts on a sticky note. Where do we find nature? What is nature? Oops, <laughs> I'm gonna move that back down. There you It's interesting that somebody said nature is beauty because I can think of a lot of things that I think of as nature that aren't particularly beautiful, <laughs> maybe in their own way. But, you know, my um, I have a, a one year old dog and I have backyard chickens and um, she decapitated one of our backyard chickens. And, wow. you know, that's natural. That's an instinct that she has as a predator. Right. I don't. I don't know if it was necessarily a beautiful sight to see, right? So that that's that's a really interesting um, interesting thing to say. Mm -hmm. Everything that is alive or has been alive at some point, right? Mm -hmm. The definition of an ecosystem is all of the biotic and abiotic factors that comprise a certain space, right? So, um, you know, an abiotic factor would be something like a mineral, a mineral in, in the soil, right? Is still considered part of nature, part of the ecosystem, because it's it's um, it changes some of the cycles that happen in that system. Good. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Good. Okay. Well, let's keep thinking about this concept of kind of where we find nature and what is nature. And for me too, this concept of um, what nature is, is so wrapped up in our personal value structures and our culture. Um, and so it's important for us to recognize like nature might not be accessible to everyone, right? This, this like pure idea of nature as, as something, you know, kind of like, I'm gonna go to Yellowstone, right? Like this untouched natural resource, an untouched natural resource. It's not gonna be accessible to everybody. Not everybody is gonna be able to have that experience. And so if we, if we seclude nature to those kinds of areas, then, then we exclude whole groups of, of individuals who don't have access to them. So I think it's important for us too, to recognize that nature can be as simple as uh, an oak tree planted in a median on a street, right? That is nature. You can, you can observe hundreds of insects that are interacting on that tree. You can observe lichens and epiphytes that are living on that tree. I found just the other day, I was in the Goodwill parking lot and they had a scraggly pine tree and it had a beautiful Encyclia tamponensis, which is a, um, a native Florida orchid, butterfly orchid on, on this sickly looking pine tree in the middle of a parking lot, right? And so part of this class that I hope we, we kind of get out of this is recognizing that nature is everywhere all the time and that we are not separate from it. 
Um, and so with that, I'm going to go ahead and, and wrap us up with this very last slide here, just because this is so good. <laughs> So um, these are just a few photos. I really love the um, behind me. This is a, a native Florida milkwort. Um, this photo is from Mayaka River State Park. Um, but then the photo on the left hand side is from our demonstration garden here at the extension office. It's a it's a native azalea that we have here in Florida. And then on the right hand side, this is a beautiful earth star mushroom that just popped up in some mulch in a landscape somewhere. And so um, the real voyage of discovery consists not of seeing new landscapes, but in having new eyes. And, and that's what nature journaling allows us to do. And that's what we're gonna practice over the next few weeks is, is learning how to have new eyes to observe those landscapes that are already around us. All right. With that, we'll go ahead and end for the day. And I look forward to seeing you all next week. Thank you so Anybody much. Have any last thoughts? Thank you so much. I'm so excited, Alyssa. This was really wonderful. Really great. Thank you. Great. Thanks. All right. Have a wonderful day, everybody. You too. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.